Welcome to Decarceration Nation, a podcast about radically reimagining America's criminal justice system. You can find all previous episodes on our website, www.decarcerationnation.com. And if you like the podcast, please remember to hit like and to subscribe to the channel below. Brandon Kramer is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, educator, and the co-founder of Murdy and Hill Pictures. Brandon's brother Lance is the co-director of the award-winning short documentary Sports Fest and Community Harvest. Together, they created the documentary feature The First Step, which is just starting its national release. In fact, in just a few weeks, I'll be participating in a panel after the movie when it shows in Lansing, Michigan. Louis L. Reed is a social justice reform advocate who was formerly with the Reform Alliance and was really central to uh, the passage of the First Step Act. Welcome to the Decarceration Nation podcast, Lance, Brandon, and Lewis. Thanks so much for having you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I always ask the same first question, and since there's three of you, there'll probably be three very different answers, but feel free to just kind of pass amongst yourselves. Uh, how did you get from wherever you started in life to becoming activists, film directors, and producers, and working together to create a movie about the passage of the First Step Act? Anyone can start. We'll, uh... So I, I think I think that I, I'll, I'll start. Uh, first and foremost, I am uh, kind of upset that this is my first time on uh, this podcast with you, Josh, considering how we've been in the trenches with one another over all of these years. We've been in this, we shared space with one another. Um, we're relatively like family. And this is the first time that I get uh, invited into a podcast. But we can talk about that. That's on fair. Another. That's fair. <laughs> we, we, we can talk about that on another episode. Um, no. Look, uh, I served 14 years in federal prison. And uh, not only did I serve 14 years in federal prison, but I was predisposed to the criminal legal system at the approximate age of five years old when both my parents were incarcerated and I had to be raised by my maternal grandmother. And so when you think about advocacy, um, for me, it actually began when my grandmother, who was an RN at the time, used to have to go down to social services um, in order to be able to get food stamps because she was taking care of both of my both myself and my sister. And I saw how she had to advocate um, on her behalf in order to be able to take care of two relatively small children. And so I think that my exposure to advocacy began as a result of my experience with my parents being incarcerated. And then ultimately it was curated through uh, my experience being in federal prison for 14 years when I just saw too many people disproportionately impacted by our criminal justice system, and I wanted to do something about it. Brandon or Lance? I can say from, from my perspective, and maybe some of this will be shared from my brothers since we did come from the same house and from the same parents. Um, funny how that works. You know, I, <laughs> funny how that works. Uh, you know, we grew up in a suburb of Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway called Bethesda, Maryland. Um, I did not know anyone who had been incarcerated growing up. It wasn't something that was in front of my eyes, even though it was really, in a sense, next, very present right next door for many people's reality in D.C. But in our little enclave, um, that wasn't a part of our daily reality. I really wanted to be a filmmaker. And I think perhaps in part due to growing up inside the Beltway, I had this urge and drive in a sense to tell stories that I felt mattered and that played a role in advocacy and activism. I think that that was strongly influenced from just growing up in kind of the soup of DC. Um, but I didn't necessarily, at least at first, uh, know that those stories would ultimately be so centrally focused on narratives around the criminal justice system and particularly people who are directly impacted. There was a long journey that's been about 15 years, almost 15 years of building relationships with people in DC in particular, and just finding that time and time and time again, the number of instances where you would encounter, we would encounter people who had had um, their lives turned completely upside down, 
um, from the criminal justice system and the injustices of the system was almost inescapable. It was very central to the first film that we made it's called City of Trees, which is more of a reentry story. Um, and we just had this kind of progression, or I'd say specifically myself, had a progression of um, feeling this, um, in a sense, almost ash ashamed that um, because of that there was the geography of where I grew up, the color of my skin, the class of our family, that we had been able to, in a sense, almost kind of escape the realities of these daily horrors that so many other people who, in a lot of cases, were our peers and had very similar um, personalities and backgrounds, except for the um, the circumstances that we're born into, um, we're, we're, we're facing these injustices. And it, it really um, made me confront what's my responsibility to try and play some sort of role in changing that system as an artist, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. Um, and that's kind of led to this now, you know, multi-year journey trying to understand these stories from a more personal point of view and bring them to light so that others can perhaps uh, you know have 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 some of the same insights that that we've had. And I'll say too, just on a really personal level, it wasn't until we started working on the first step film that we also then wound up having people in our own family who had direct experiences with the criminal justice system. So eventually it caught up with us, but not until we were actually working on the film itself. Brendan, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, there's two things. One is that, you know, we grew up in a household and in a family and in a community where there was very deep interpersonal relationships and connections. Um, some of that was with people that were politically, socially aligned, and some of which it wasn't. It was with people, you know, cousins, uncles, aunts that are on the opposite end of the political spectrum. But there was a very deep sense of connection, of vulnerability, of integrity, of respect, uh, being honest and truthful, confronting difficult kinds of conversations. That ethic and that set of values, I think, is something that Lance and I carry with us and has fueled our interest in storytelling around bridge building and around people forming relationships from very different backgrounds and lived experiences in both films that we've made. That's one thing. The other thing I'll just say is that just growing up in the DC area, as Lance mentioned, you're surrounded by people who are trying to create a positive change in this world. And Lance and I have been really fascinated as storytellers in understanding what are the complexities around what it actually looks like to create change in, in this country. What are the emotions? What are the stakes that people experience? What does it look like from multiple vantage points? And so with City of Trees, we followed what the what the story the human story of when a policy the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act passes how does that impact a community in DC and with this film we were really interested in what is the human story behind creating policy so following Lewis Van Jessica in their advocacy efforts to actually create a bill that would impact thousands of people's lives so I want to ask a couple of film questions. I'm kind of a film buff and, uh, you know, I won't, I doubt I'll get many opportunities to talk to producers and directors of any, you know, again, I think everyone has a dream at some point of kind of being an actor or director or producer, but it seems pretty impossible for most of us. Uh, how did, how did that process happen for both of y'all? And uh, are the barriers as as high as it seems like they are? Uh, the process or the, the origin of the dream to be a filmmaker goes back to when we were little kids. I mean, we used to borrow our parents' old clunky VHS camcorder and make not documentaries. And I certainly would not say that they had really any so social purpose, uh, but they were just us playing basically with the video camera and bringing the neighborhood kids, our friends into the into the mix to make, you know, things that 
felt silly and fun to us. And that, you know, started 35 years ago. And the, the idea of wanting to be a filmmaker, both as a creative practice and also as a profession, I think, or goes back that far as well. I think that for me personally, though, that was interrupted by the reality that I didn't know any filmmakers. Growing up in DC, it's not like we were in LA or New York where you could kind of spit in any direction and find someone that worked in film. That just wasn't the reality, you know, here. So I didn't actually know anyone that worked in film. And I certainly didn't have any reference points for how you could do that as a career. So that actually felt very far afield. And I had a kind of journey myself, at least professionally and through education, then of first studying journalism and feeling like that was maybe the way to get kind of close or proximate to storytelling, the kind of storytelling that I loved in film, but felt like there was a little bit more of a, a, a career path in journalism than there was in film. Um, and that's ultimately what I did after school. And then lo and behold, when the combination of the 2008 uh, recession and also just the kind of collapse of print journalism around that time started to really take hold. It forced me to really rethink what was possible. I had a kind of long road that brought me towards moving back to DC. I was living on the West Coast, moved to DC, and just discovered this amazing documentary film community here that I never, never, never paid any attention to while I was growing up, but had been here, in fact, for a really long time. And there's a great tradition of nonfiction filmmaking that actually comes from DC, filmmakers, festivals, nonprofits. Um, and I just started getting involved in the community here and just found that documentary film in particular was this really amazing um, medium and community that was focused on excellent storytelling and excellent filmmaking, but also a very close relationship with activism and organizing and community building and all these other uh, qualities that are really important to me just as a person, not just as a filmmaker. And so I just kind of dove in head first. And that's pretty much what I've been trying to pursue ever since then, the past 15 years or so. So it kind of started for you all like the Fablemans a little bit, right? <laughs> Putting on plays with your friends and stuff like that. Uh, Brandon, did you have anything that, you know, about over kind of the overcoming barriers and kind of starting that, that, that direction in your life? You know, I think I feel really blessed in having parents like our dad is a sculptor and an architect he has his own architecture firm uh we have a lot of family members who have been entrepreneurial in their pursuit of whatever it is that they do in life and in many ways i almost felt felt naive to the barriers of creating your own business your own uh your own pursuit of filmmaking to me it felt like that is the path my dad that's what my dad did that he raised us through his art form and creating a business around it and so um in many ways the barriers have been a little shocking to me um it's and frustrating and disheartening at times that you know, it's, we could have a whole podcast on this, but, you know, the documentary, we're in a heyday, quote unquote, heyday of documentary film. A lot more, more people are watching documentaries than ever before. And yet there are so many independent documentary filmmakers that are creating very meaningful, complicated, bold films and stories that are struggling to make its way and permeate through some of these gatekeepers and platforms. And so I feel personally just very committed, not just for our own film, but for our entire field in exploring and reconciling and trying to understand how this heyday that we're in can be inclusive and, and embrace 
the incredible stories that are being created because I do think that there are some formulas and some uh, some ways that media is being created that does a really good job playing to the masses, but also can shut out films that are taking, you know, some some bold and untraditional steps and and de- and frankly dealing with controversial figures and, and narratives like our film. You know, this is not a this is not a safe film. What Van and Lewis and Jessica did was not safe. They built allies with extraordinarily controversial figures and um, went into the lion's den and took enormous risks to their uh, to their relationships. And I have deep deep respect for them. And I think by telling a story about that effort, uh, art mirrors life in certain ways and. You know, in many ways, we were going up against the grain to some narrative trends that exist in our field. I think it's a good chance to bring back in Lewis. I think a lot of people who are activists uh, are interested in producing content, uh, even if it's just on social media or something like that. But I think a lot of people in our position as formerly incarcerated people are also afraid to do that. Uh, what things would you tell someone who's just starting out, Lewis? Well, First and foremost, um, it, you can't talk about this film without talking about the state of Michigan, without talking about how Josh Ho has been um, our secret sauce and being able to get the First Step Act um, uh, really organized um, within the state of Michigan. I may share, um, as well as Topeka and Topeka K. Sam and David Safavian, we may share the lines. Sh- the the lion's uh, share of credit from the justice impacted uh, perspective, um, and we were far much more front facing. But we don't win this 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 bill. We don't we don't win we don't win without Josh Ho. Um, really through the the contacts and 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 how you really just put your fingers in the dirt um, um, in the state. And I'm not saying that the state of Michigan is dirty. Um, <laughs> the work of advocacy, especially around the First Step Act, was really a, a messy process. Um, and we didn't win without Josh really being an integral part of, of our campaign. Um, so I just really, really wanted to publicly give you your flowers, um, Josh, in that regard. Thanks uh, second, so much, Louis. Yeah. Secondly, um, look, how do you get involved? How do you get started in advocacy? You do so based off of issues that you're passionate about. If you're passionate about kids that skip in the rain, uh, <laughs> who seem to be in a in a, in a uh, some type of you know drought, um, then get passionate about it. Get involved. You know, advocacy now is different, Josh, than when we probably first started. Uh, I remember when I initially went to prison they had beepers and I come home now they have smartphones. And so advocacy can actually be literally at the convenience of your fingertips. You can see a cause that you want to be aligned to. You can simply retweet. You can post about it. Um, You can start a podcast. You can go live and just share what your notions are about a particular issue. But specifically on the First Step Act, what end up happening is that you had the alignment of thousands of people who had been impacted by the criminal justice system on the federal level, some even on the state level, and all of us came together and said, we want to do something. We don't care who's in the White House, so long as we can get our loved ones out of the prison house back to our own house. That's, that's a, in effect, what the spirit that of of what this film encapsulates people who were trying to do our best to bring our loved ones home that is it and while we had the benefit of having cameras document that process this is a process that happens day in and night and night out on the local state and federal level. You have people who have been impacted by an issue. Look, Jessica never spent a day in prison herself, but her heart was incarcerated when her ex-husband, the father of her firstborn child, when he was incarcerated in the state of Georgia. 
which ultimately springboarded her into a law career. Uh, the Kramer brothers, they have never been incarcerated themselves. However, when they heard about this bill that was being uh, matriculated uh, through Congress and trying to be ratified through Congress, I should say, um, they got more involved. Um, they could they could have been doing a film on anything else. They could have been doing a film on police violence. Uh, they could have been doing a film on the rainforest. They could have been doing a film on a, a plethora of other issues, but they chose to put their camera in, in, in and focus their lens on our issue. What is our issue, Josh? Our issue is that there are too many black, brown, and poor white people disproportionately impacted by the criminal legal system. Yes, we got people out, but we still got 70 million people in this country who have criminal histories. And so how do we reduce the, the 46,000 collateral consequences, according to the American Bar Association, how do we, do, do we reduce those collateral consequences so that people can actually have full citizenship uh, in, their, in their community after incarceration? So some people, uh, you know, maybe trying to just get some some stuff out there. Maybe some people are actually interested in becoming, you know, directors and producers or making documentary films. This will be kind of my last of the film specific questions. But Brendan and Lance, uh, I think Brendan talked about this a little bit already. There's some there's some struggles. Uh, I imagine money is one of the biggest challenges. How does a documentary film get made these days? What is the process and what should people know? Well, the way it gets made is, I guess it's always been changing, but I feel like it's get, it's changing very rapidly now. When we started making films about 15 years ago, look, we've always been independent filmmakers. And I feel like it was more the norm that you looked in one direction or the other, and we were surrounded by other independent filmmakers. And there were more kind of independent paths that films traveled, film festivals, public broadcasts educational impact that was the trajectory of a lot of films and also this kind of scrappiness of run a kickstarter campaign call your mama call your dad call your uncle that you never call except you know when you need something like that was you know house parties like that was the way these things favors these things came together not for everyone but for a lot of people and nowadays you have multi-billion dollar streaming companies that are building huge parts of their portfolio and their slate off of what they call documentaries. A lot of times it's really reality TV or nonfiction, but different types of films than the kinds of things that we've been trying to make. Uh, but nonetheless, it's become this huge, huge, huge industry. And so there's that, which, you know, like Brandon was saying, in some ways is kind of viewed as the golden age of documentary just because there's more being made. Um, but um, that is a pathway, at least from a career perspective and to a certain extent from a creative pers perspective for people to um, be a part of. Um, but it's also become much harder in some respects to make something independently because that space has just consumed so much attention and resource. So in some ways, if you have an original idea or a point of view or perspective that has been marginalized from that ecosystem, that commercial ecosystem, in some ways it's actually become a little harder, in my view, to get things made and also then seen. And you have to, unfortunately, fight very hard to get that thing made and also to get it seen. And in a sense, your role as a filmmaker also starts to mirror the role of an activist or an organizer because you wind up having to do a lot of that type of advocacy for your own work just for it to exist in the world yeah i think um, i just so saw sense, a picture. I, I, I get a lot of my lessons from lewis and team you know in terms of how they get a bill passed you know i think i just a saw a picture work. earlier today of you on a panel maybe yesterday I, I don't know talking about the film uh maybe with uh someone from dream core or dream dream.org yeah totally we were on a panel with uh candia milton from dream.org last night actually talking about this exact thing and, and are about to be on a panel with him again in four hours <laughs> this is what happens when you're starting national release right <laughs> uh so this brings us to the film the first step uh you know 
as we said before, Lewis is kind of one of the three stars of the film in a lot of ways. So, Lewis, do you want to kind of just describe the film for everyone? Well, look, I may be one of the three stars of the film, um, but my participation in the film, again, is a representation of the collective um, effort that went into advocacy on this film. Um, you know, I, I can't underscore to our listening audience enough that you're too modest um, to brag on yourself, but I, I, I want to brag on you. We do not win the First Step Act. We do not win Michigan. We do not generate the support out of the state of Michigan without the advocacy um, and without the genius and without the strategy such as of, of folks such as Josh Ho, um, uh, Elder Leslie uh, Matthews, and also uh, uh, Nick uh, Buckingham as well. Um, so I, I can't underscore like you guys really being the secret sauce um, in that particular state. But back back to the above, uh, in terms of what this film is about. Look, this film is it, it it's a microcosm, in effect, uh, of of a labor of of love, um, the love that we have for this work, the love that we have for the people, and the love that we had that had to rise above the hate that was tethered to the former uh, administration, um, that was led by President Donald J. Trump. It, it literally was a labor of love. Um, the reason why we refuse to give up, the reason why we refuse to die, you know this, Josh, you know, better than I do. Um, the reason why we refuse to die was because our love wouldn't allow our, our, our people that we cared about to languish in federal prison under the provisions that we were trying to uh, uh, get accomplished in the federal in, uh, on the federal level in the first step act and so what you are going to see is what that process was like how a conversation go is translated into words on a piece of paper as brandon describes that ultimately um is produced into a bill that ultimately is taken up by a legislative body that ultimately um, was passed. I will also add this as well, um, just as, as a PS. The First Step Act is literally unimpeachable. It is the only criminal justice reform bill, as far as I'm aware of, that has been passed by Congress, signed by the President of the United States of America, and as of June of 2022, has been affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. And to date, we have been able to release approximately 75,000 people as a result of this bill being passed, um, this bill giving birth to the CARES Act and, um, you know, other uh, other uh, other bills that have been out there as well. So we're extremely, we're extremely um, uh, proud of, of the work that we we've done uh, on this bill. And again, you know, the, the viewing audience is going to see what our heart and soul was um, and being able to bring this to fruition. The viewing audience is also going to not see a leftist uh, 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 apolo apology film or, or, or film that specifically covers the right. This is literally something that is for every single person, no matter what side of the aisle uh, you stand on. And so we've got this movie, you're, you're starting at a part, I mean, when you start the movie, it's not, you know, at the end of the, the journey. Uh, how did, Brandon, how did you get hooked up with Van, Lewis, Jessica, and get interested in this project? And how did it kind of move forward? Hey, 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 Brandon, I think that you should probably tell the cool story that didn't get captured in the film that you always wish that you would have <laughs> captured about how when I met, when you get to the portion about how when I met Van, it's 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 pretty cool, Josh. I, we've never talked about this publicly. Awesome. Uh, I'll talk about how I met Van first, then I'll talk about how I met Lewis. Um, Van, Van, Lance, and I knew each other. I mean, I've known, obviously, I know, obviously I've known Lance my whole life uh lance and i met van uh several years before we started production on this film um we had made a web series with van called the messy truth which was a series of conversations that van had in the homes of trump supporters to model how to have conversations across lines of division 
um, and a few other projects. And in 2016, Van sat down with Lance and I and basically said, look, a lot of my peers leaders in the progressive movement are going to be resisting and fighting this administration and the harmful actions they're going to be taking over these four years. That's very important work, but I am going to be looking to find any room for engagement and common ground to get something done on the addiction crisis, on criminal justice reform, and any of these issues where there's even a sliver of overlap. And as filmmakers that were deeply concerned about all the terrible things Donald Trump might accomplish, we were also even more concerned about the country spiraling away from each other. And we didn't see that many stories that were being told that really got into the nitty gritty understanding of what does it take to work across these lines of division? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Where is there room to accomplish something? And why are so few people doing it? And here we had access to a public figure and a leader that was running right into the lion's den to tackle one of the most difficult issues, criminal justice reform, by means of working with Donald J. Trump and Jared Kushner and other Republicans and Democrats. And we felt that whatever happened with that story, it would be a really important document for the American public to have, to experience, and to see. And we felt like the way that the story needed to be told was in a way that did not just empathize and connect and understand Lewis and Van and Jessica's point of view, but also the people who the progressive leaders like Patrice Cullors, like Bonnie Watson Coleman, who have been fighting for criminal justice reform their whole lives, doing really important work, but were opposed to the bill because that point of view needed to be respected and lifted up and empathized and connected with too. The film needed to represent fairly conservative leaders. Jared Kushner, Mike Lee, Rand Paul, who were working on this effort for their own reasons, which were very different. You know, whether it's uh, Christian conservative re feeling reasons of redemption or or wasteful government spending or fiscal responsibility being the reason to work toward criminal justice reform. They had their own reasons. And what we sought to do is create a film that gives you a window into multiple political positions on this issue. And audiences from a diverse range of backgrounds can watch it. They can find protagonists in the film that they relate to and connect with and that align with their views, and therefore they can trust, hopefully, what they're seeing, because we live in a moment where it's really hard to trust anything. A lot of media just toes a certain line and advocates for a specific position. This film doesn't do that. But then they can also be introduced to a view that is different than theirs, and maybe not, the film is not seeking to convert anyone to a different viewpoint, but they can at least gain some understanding. And instead of how the media typically depicts these kind of struggles and, and battles within parties or between parties in a very reductive way, by get, engaging with it with a lot more nuance and complexity, the hope is that it disarms people. And then in their own lives, whether that's with their neighbors, their families, school boards, for legislators working at the state level, they have some, a little bit, 2% more openness to building relationships and talking and dialoguing across these lines of difference. Lewis, I met. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to ask you the story. Long-winded <laughs> way to get to Lewis. Sorry, Lewis, I buried the lead. Um, <laughs> I was in the room when Lewis was uh, interviewing for his job with Van and Jessica. And I actually had a camera in my hand. Um, it, it was at a coffee shop. And, you know, Van, I, Van basically said, look, if you're going to work with us, you got to be prepared 
to take enormous heat that's going to come your way. We're just at the beginning of this journey. And this is what we're experiencing. We're being attacked in this way. We're being isolated, alienated. This is not the this is not for the faint of heart. And you really need to be in it for the right reasons. You need to be able to uh, withstand a lot of alienation, isolation, because bridge building in this moment is just, it's not a popular path to go down. If you're looking for laurels, if you're looking to have your bat packed, if you're looking to increase your followers, this is not necessarily the, the journey to go on. And I just remember Lewis just, you know, walking into that conversation, Lewis, you'll have to correct me because, you know, I'm relying on memory here, but um, you had your own my memory is you had your own questions and concerns about what was about what van and team were happening. You obviously were supportive enough to take the interview and to have the conversation, but you also were a little skeptical before walking into that, if I remember. And I yeah. think in that conversation, you were you van and Jessica sort of laid out their strategy. And instead of seeing what was happening on social media, you were hearing it directly. And then I, what I saw was, your strategy, your own strategy as an advocate and Van's strategy as an advocate coming together and really merging in this beautiful way. And I'm sitting there as the filmmaker with my camera on my lap, not recording because I felt like it was such a sacred moment. Like two people, two leaders were meeting each other for the first time. And I wanted, I didn't want to, as a filmmaker, you have to constantly decide, you know, do I want to like bring a camera into the space a lot of, 99% of the time the answer is yes because you're trying to make a movie in this particular moment i felt like it was so sacred and so delicate and i was just meeting lewis for the first time i knew van but i didn't know you and i decided not to and it's something that i've had to wrestle with for the last 6 years i'm like oh that that would that would have definitely made it into the final cut of the film so, so you know the interesting thing josh is that i i went to dc to meet Jessica uh, and with the expectation that I was going to meet Alex Gudich, who at the time was our deputy director. And it was supposed to have been a half an hour interview. And this half an hour so-called interview ended up turning into an hour and a half, almost two hour conversation. Um, and it was just something that was, look, I, I went in there with my own stereotypes and presuppositions and I said, okay, at the very least, I'll 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 take the meeting, um, you know, and and just hear people out because I wanted to be heard out as well, um, you know, based off of my experience, right? You know, aside from the social media portion, et cetera, I wanted to hear what exactly was in this bill um and how I could potentially sort of kind of maybe with trepidation and apprehension be a thought partner. And literally in the process of that nearly two hour conversation, um, I was evangelized, uh, 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 so to speak. Um, and I just believed in Jessica's strategy. I believed in, in, in Van's leadership and ultimately the, 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 the fruits of it speaks for itself. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we were giving each other flowers. We were giving me flowers earlier. I want to give you back your flowers. You, in a lot of ways, were the face of this thing all across the country in meetings and in just in rooms full of people in every state, you know, probably in the whole country. Uh, and one of the most powerful, I think maybe the most powerful scene in the movie, at least for me, is where a legislator, in essence, tries to kind of deny you your dignity and your ability to change. And you kind of read him. And it, it's a really, I mean, really kind of the core of what we work on, I think, uh, as activists in this area. Uh, not only, Josh, Josh, not only what we work on, but what we work through. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that, for sure. That is, that's a reflection of what we have to go through every single day. Not while you are walking the halls of power, but literally while you are walking your own block in your community. You have police officers who want to reduce your personhood down to you having a criminal conviction. You have probation officers who only see, see static factors in your life rather than, than those dynamic things that you are evolving into and, and out of. You have social service people who won't even speak with you with a degree of empathy um, and human dignity because they're looking at a background and they're saying, oh, you're ineligible for this based off of this right here. So while the film captured 
that exchange um, between me and that individual, that really represents the things that you and I are faced with every single day as a result of being justice impacted. Uh, so having gone through that, uh, what was it like to see that on screen? Was that different than, you know, I mean, did you feel? Yeah, I'm going to tell you in the, in the moment I was, I was, I was, I was focused on the mission. It was mission, 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 mission. The first time that I saw that, I, I got emotional. I didn't realize the gravity of what that exchange was like for me um, and for other people who actually watched it. We've been in screenings where people like you can audibly hear people in their seats gasping like oh, the nerve of this guy. Right. And then you kind of like can hear the 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 applause uh, 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 at, at the end of that exchange. Right. And most times when, when I get feedback about this film, folks always point to that particular scene, not just because I'm in it. It's just kind of like, wait, how, how are you holding up at that? You, you, you almost watch it and forget <laughs> that it happened years ago. Right. Cause people will come up to me like, Hey, how, how are you feeling? And I'm like, I'm I'm great, but yeah, I just saw that scene. That it didn't happen in the hallway, right? This happened, um, and it was recorded. It was it was it was filmed and it was edited. <laughs> However, I'm okay. But I think that that's that's how visceral of a reaction that people have, um, and that's how invested they are in the film up to that point, where it's kind of like, wait, wait, I'm I'm here. I'm 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 with these people, right? Like I know Jessica. I I understand Van. I'm with Lewis. I'm with all of these people. And for you to do that to him, no, I don't like it. So I I, I think that that's that that's what that 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 particular scene uh, embodies. I just want to I just want to I just want to underscore something Lewis said that it, the ending of that scene in many screenings you get full applause from the audience. I just want to be clear. In documentary film screenings, you do not get, you get applauses maybe if you're lucky at the end of the film when the movie ends for to be in the middle of the film and have in many cases people screaming at the uh uh the the screen and applauding. It's an incredible it's not and it's not an incredible feat of filmmaking. It's an incredible feat of Lewis you know, withstanding a, a level of uh, denial of his humanity and just pushing right through that and that registering with audiences the same way they respond to moments in superhero movies. You know, it was like <laughs> Batman in a way, or I don't know. It's a superhero moment. Yeah, here's a, a funny aside is that Lewis and myself and Lance were at a, a screening of this at the Detroit Film Festival and uh, there, it was during COVID, and so there were like 13 people in the room, and there was still that reaction, even with only a few people in the room. So, you know, it's a it's a pretty powerful. Uh, hopefully, everyone will get a chance to to see that, and, uh, understand what we're talking about, uh, Lance. So, you know, there's this process, and you're watching legislation. Did you all have strategies mapped out, like for if it had been delayed another year or changed, or what if it hadn't passed? Would it have? I mean, what would have that done to your to to the documentary process? Well, I want to talk about what the, what it would have done to the legislative process. If we didn't get it passed, you you remember, Josh? Everyone everyone was saying now is not the time. Let's wait. Let's wait until we get a new Congress. Let's wait until we get a new president. We can't give this president a win. We can't give Lindsey Graham and the Republicans in the Senate a win. We can't give them a win. If we would have waited. Or if that bill would have died, there would have been no resurrection of the First Step Act. Let's be clear. So before we talk about the, the, the documentary process, let's ultimately talk about the legislative process. Because what this film does, it, it captures what the what the legislative process was, right? And so, yes, I mean, Lance can speak to this, you know, of, of a better mind than I can um, from the filmmaking perspective. Yes, a film may have been made. That that's without question. Um, but would the film have been made with the impact that we were being able to have 
as a result of this bill being passed, I, I highly doubt it. And, and do you remember, uh, Lewis, I don't know if you remember at the Detroit Film Festival, the moderator asked me, uh, was it all worth it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just started laughing. Like, I, mean, and I was like, 30, at that time, 30,000 people had come home. That's why I do this work. Of course it was worth it. So yeah, for those people's lives, it was really important that we passed it. I mean, and, you know, there were probably 10 times I can remember where it felt like it was dead in the water and just we just kept on fighting and you know hey, and hey, hey I'm, i'll toss it over to lance but brendan and i the other night in at the new york premiere um for the first time we talked about how there's a, a moment in the film where i heard from the first time from brandon him saying he just thought that it was over it was done like let's let's pull the plug on the cameras and let, <laughs> let's start a, let's start thinking about what this what the final scenes of the film were going to be because it was done um and we thought that at the time Tom Cotton had outmaneuvered us um and you know this bill died at least at least 10 times um and it, you know and it was resurrected at least 30 times so uh yeah but but go ahead Lance sorry no, I mean, I'm I'm glad, I'm glad you you spoke up first because in a sense, it's like the film, a documentary film. It's a, you you you're trying to capture reality. You're trying to capture something in real life that's happening before your eyes. So we didn't have a script. We were trying to be responsive to what was happening in real time. If you go back to when we started the film, we knew Van, but we didn't know Lewis. We didn't know Jessica. There was not a bill. Van didn't know Jared Kushner. So all these things, when we started back in, you know, late 2016, early 2017, though, like, we had a question and we had a curiosity about what to try and capture in this story, but we didn't have all the specifics. And so this whole time, we were trying to just follow, we were trying to follow the story as it was unfolding. And so where, you know, we didn't know what would come next. We had a, we knew how hard everyone was fighting for it. So we knew they weren't going to let up to the bitter end. That was clear, clear as day. Um, but I will say that, you know, there were moments, especially during that time where the outcome of the bill was um, uncertain. And uh, even when the bill was basically dead, because it almost, I think for all intents and purposes, for the people fighting for it too, felt like, you know, it wasn't just on the ropes, but it might have just been, frankly, just like totally dead in the water at, at certain key points, some of which is in the film. You know, I was having conversations with mentors just from a storytelling perspective that was trying to understand, okay, so if the bill doesn't pass, you know, what kind of story do we have here? And, you know, people are saying, well, you know, you got to remember... I remember very vividly that I had a conversation with one of my mentors who said, you know, maybe what you'll have here is a Rocky story. Mm. People forget that in Rocky, Rocky yeah, he loses. doesn't win. He loses. Yeah. Everyone loves Rocky. It's one of the great films of all time. He loses in the first film. And so I remember one of my mentors um, said to me, he's like, well, you know, you might just wind up having a Rocky film, which is a great film. But then you know, and and that kind of stuck with me, and I and I was trying to just, you know, we couldn't and wouldn't would never have wanted to force the narrative one way or another. We were trying to understand what will be revealed or offered to a viewer from having had the experience of being with everyone through this journey and through this fight, so that there's something impactful to take away one one way or another. Um, you know, and thank you know, thank God the bill passed, and 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 all these circumstances, you know, coalesce so that so that that signature could become a reality. So you all have been rolling out the film for a while now. There was kind of the circuit of uh, all the festivals, and now you're starting to do national release. Uh, if anyone watching or listening to this now, you know, what would what's something you would like to tell them about? You know, either why they should go the film, uh, see the film, or why it was. Uh, why it was so important to each of you. And I think this is for all, all three of you can take a stab at it. Do you want me to start? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, so I'll say that uh, obviously, you know, we've all lived through COVID the last couple of years. 
three it's going on three years now you know and the level of isolation i think has hit everyone in deep and i know very different ways for everyone i think you probably could not find any person or very few people in this country that haven't done a lot of watching movies at home by yourself or just with your family you know streaming a film um and it's great to see the great to know that films are as accessible as they are right now in that respect but for some films it really makes a difference to go into a movie theater on a big screen with no distractions sit with people who you either know or who have never met be immersed in a story hear those gasps like what Lewis and Brandon were talking about feel if there's a moment of a film that's uncomfortable to feel that with other people if there's a moment of victory to feel that with other people just just be immersed i think is something that has always been very precious and special and important and i think especially nowadays is really critical and then on top of that to be able to have the experience of hearing from um, people like Lewis, like Candia Milton, like Britton Smith, like the countless local leaders who are showing up at every single one of these screenings. Just repeat that. There is not a way to see this movie in the United States where it is not presented with organizations and leaders who are working on the front lines of trying to pass criminal justice reform or bring people together on a local or national level. 100% of the screenings are programmed that way. And so this is also a really, I think, impactful and important opportunity to not just experience the film, but also meet these frontline leaders and organizations and learn how you can be a part of that work. And so we've tried to be very intentional in designing the release to put that at the forefront. A lot of these organizations too are led by justice impacted people in states where it's not easy to get things done and they need, need all the help that uh, that they can get. So from uh, that would be my my pitch is that that's a, a really unique and I think important, uh, not just experience, but frankly, movement that people you know can be a part of just by showing up and going to a screening. Brandon, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'll say a few things. Uh, one is that there is a bill that was just introduced this week called the Equal Act. I don't I don't believe we've talked about that yet on this, have we? I don't no. think so. No. Um, it reintroduced, it, it, actually. It almost sorry. It could have should have probably passed last session, but we'll, we'll hopefully it will this time. Reintroduced uh Lindsey Graham as one of the sponsors of the piece of the legislation. Um this bill would impact another tens of thousands of people's lives. It is very much a continuation of the advocacy that you see in this film. So for one, just learn about the bill, go to dream.org, go to the Reform Alliance, like do your homework to find organizations working to push this bill forward because it is a major way to impact people's lives who are impacted by the system. Um, that's one thing on the criminal justice side. On just the human side, I had somebody at a screening recently say to me, you know, how, you know, did, now that January 6th has happened and now that all the terrible things that Donald Trump and the Republican Party have done since that time, do you have regrets in telling this story or would you do have done it differently? And I've gotten this sort of question at, at different moments through the, you know, almost hundred screenings that we've done. Um, and the answer to that is no. The answer is, to me, I hope one of the major takeaways of this film is that you get to see, you get to sit in the safety and comfort of a seat in a theater and experience in a very intimate way what it felt like for Lewis to have the kind of exchange that you were discussing with Lawrence Leisure, to see Tylo James, an activist from South Central Los Angeles, go on a plane and 
go to West Virginia to meet with Trump supporters and sit at a diner across from them and break bread with people whose votes have been extremely damaging and consequential to her and her community. These actions take enormous courage and they're very unpopular and they're very controversial. And my hope is that you get to sit in a theater and it makes you a little uncomfortable and you have to wrestle with that. We had to wrestle with it as filmmakers. God knows Lewis had to wrestle with it when he stepped foot in these spaces. And maybe it flexes some muscles in your gut that can increase your tolerance for stepping into difficult conversations or uncomfortable spaces. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to continue down the path we're going down, which is not serving us very well. So I hope the film can be just a small bit of medicine to breaking down some of these hardened ways that we are. And that we're hardened for good reason because there's terrible things happening. And it's hard to even remotely consider building a relationship with people that are causing enormous harm and damage to your community. But we have to find some way to get at each other's hearts and minds. Otherwise, we're going to continue down the path we're on. So uh, what's next for you two uh, now that you've finished this project? Once this finally, you know, once it's had its national run and all that, what's what's on the horizon for you two? Well, we want to, it's interesting. We, we, we've had done a lot of reflection um, just about the kinds of stories that we've told over the last, you know, decade and a half and have, which have all been nonfiction. Um, one of which has been very personal, but most of which have not been directly, you know, about us or our family, so to speak. And, um, and we've, you know, going back to when we were little kids, I was talking about earlier, and we were, you know, dreaming about being filmmakers. Just to be honest, we weren't dreaming about being documentary filmmakers. I think we were visioning more to uh, being fiction filmmakers. And so I think that our experience as documentary filmmakers has taught us how to make films, um, which I think just storytelling kind of doesn't necessarily fit into like nonfiction fiction boxes. It's just hopefully good storytelling. Um, but we've had, we've done a lot of reflection and kind of gotten in touch with a lot of um, narratives that we really would like to tell that are fictional, that would require writing them, but are very personal or just close to our own experience in some shape or form. And that's been something we've just, uh, both creatively and person personally wanted to explore with with next projects so i think probably the next film that we re you know produce direct together will be a fiction film um and then we also want to use some of the things we've learned from making non-fiction films of our own and also just the relationships and connections and whatnot that we've built to try and help some other people get their films made and seen um and so that's also something that we're trying to focus on as well okay i always ask my guests if there are any criminal justice related books that they like and might recommend to our listeners do either or both of you have any favorite books that might uh fit into this as you look behind me if you're watching instead of listening you can see i i, I i'm a big reader so <laughs> yes hmm. i recently finished reading the book clara and the sun it's an incredible film about, uh, takes the point of view of an artificially intelligent uh, doll for a little girl. And, you know, it's, it's people often talk about AI, they think that sci-fi, you think thriller, you think, um, you know, end of the world devastation. This is a movie that, looks through the lens of an artificially created being and through this through her as the protagonist uh it reveals just so much about the complexity around 
um, a family's fear of death and um, fear of losing each other and the pursuit of technology to uh, cover up and try to try to avoid direct confrontation with um with you know real sense of loss and and tragedy in family and it's a beautiful beautiful film and i mean beautiful book it plays like a film in my head and i highly recommend it to anybody well coming from I, a filmmaker that's high praise right uh lance um i'll recommend uh i recently read the water dancer by Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, his novel. And while it's, I mean, it, you know, it's, I, I bring it up in the context of this conversation because it's a, it's a, it's a novel written from the perspective of someone who was enslaved. And I, in a incredibly gripping and heartbreaking and powerful, very personal way. And it, it shed light on point of view and perspective of someone who had been enslaved in ways that I had never, just never grappled with on the level that I did through reading that um, story. Is and so in a sense, I think also it's just informed not just my sense of history from that time, but also obviously as we know, the origins of the mass incarceration system go way back to that time too. So it's it's helped me to just gain some greater perspective on uh, a lot of the issues at hand today. And um, and it's also just a beautifully, beautifully, beautifully written book. I highly, highly recommend it. So I always ask the same last question, what did I mess up? What question should I have asked but did not? And uh, this, I always consider this kind of the humility question, but I just like to hear what people would have liked to talk, if there were things that you would have liked to talk about. I don't think you messed up at all, Josh. I think... <laughs> I think the only That's thing nice I'd say, I'm maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, I'm just being nice. Um, the only thing, maybe I'll kind of build off Lewis. It's like, you know, I, I think you're almost too humble because you do so much uh, incredible work yourself. And, you know, as, as, as curious as you've been to hear from us, I think that, you know, I, I the, the conversations that we've had, you know, outside of this podcast, I've, I've learned so much from you. And so, there's a part of me that wishes that there was maybe more equity in the in the interviewer interviewee uh, uh, dynamic because because I, I yeah that's that's my biggest gripe. I have done a couple episodes where someone interviewed me, uh, where I just let them kind of go crazy. But you know, I mean, when you're the host, you kind of gotta. The, hopefully, I, I don't know the way I was. I always looked at it as the host is hopefully making the guests. The, the center of the thing so you know i don't know that's just my also, personal approach but i, I understand also, what you're saying yeah also i just love your take on film and the conversations that we've had about movies like not just in the world of criminal justice but just movies and 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 your love of film is is is, is something that i love about you and i just love talking about movies and stuff we love so that's also maybe just in another episode or just yeah i would love to do it in lansing we could talk more just about if it wasn't a criminal love. justice po podcast i would definitely do whole episodes just about movies because i i see pretty much every movie that you can see as long as it's if i can find it in lansing uh brandon did you is there anything you wanted to talk about that maybe i didn't hit on no, just look, if, if your viewer, um, your viewers or listeners want to watch the film, firststepfilm.com is the place to go to find out if the film is playing in a city near you. Uh, follow the film on at First Step Movie on all the social media platforms. This is an independent film with an independent release. It's not a big major studio film. It feels like a big major studio film when you see it. But it's not, um, we're relying on the support of a grassroots groundswell to get this film into the world. And so anyone who has been moved by the words that you've heard in this podcast, please uh, follow us, find out if the film is playing near you. It will be released on, uh, uh, it'll be streaming sometime in the coming months. 
And so you can, by following us on social media, you also find out when the film, if it's not playing in a theater near you, when you when it will be playing online, and then you'll be able to uh, w- watch the film in that way. And really uh, appreciate being on your show, Josh. And for those people who are listening in Michigan, it is uh, show. It's going to be showing in Grand Rapids. Uh, I think is it the seventh? Is that right? Maybe. Uh, and then I think uh, in Lansing on the ninth. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually be there for that. So anyone wants to say hi, that's a good place to catch me. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank both of y'all for doing this. This was really, uh, really great. And uh, it's nice to finally meet you, Brandon. It's great to meet you too. Lance has said wonderful things about you. Lewis has said wonderful things about you. I'm honored to finally meet you and to be uh, on your show. And thanks for just the thoughtful questions. My pleasure. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks so much, Joshua. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Decarceration Nation podcast. You can learn more about this episode in the notes or visit our website, www.decarcerationnation.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe and please like this episode and leave comments below. Special thanks to Andrew Stein, who does the editing and post-production for me, to Ann Aspo for helping with our transcripts and social media images, and to Alex Mayo, who helps with our website and does the video transcription. Make sure and add us on social media and share our posts across your network. Also, thanks to my employer, Safe and Just Michigan, for helping to support the Decarceration Nation podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Decarceration Nation podcast. See you next time.